My real area of sort of expertise within GIST collections is actually on e-books. And in 2007, I managed the GIST National e-books Observatory project, which did a lot of work looking into user behaviours um, and worked with cyber at UCL on doing a deep log analysis and lots of different research. And that was quite a world-leading project, and it was actually that project that led me towards OAPEN. And um, what OAPEN stands for is Open Access Publishing in European Networks. It was originally a project funded by the EC and managed by the University of Amsterdam Press. And that project spent a long time exploring open access scholarly monographs, looking at user needs, looking at perceptions, and exploring some of the business models and challenges around open access publishing. So today I'm just going to give you a quick introduction into Open, into open UK. And then um, I'm going to talk about some of the findings. Uh, and it was quite interesting when Martin and Alma were talking because I was sat there thinking, oh, at a practical level, there's some really quite different attitudes and opinions coming from the humanities and social science scholars that we're talking to. Um, so I think I'll try and pull some of those out as we go through the presentation. So Open UK is a four-year research project. Um, it's funded by JISC and the HRC. Uh, the aim of the project is to explore the open access environment in terms of scholarly monographs, but only in the humanities and social sciences. And the driver behind this project really is the fact that so much is happening in the journals market, but there is very little attention in terms of open access in, in humanities and social sciences. I mean, all of the announcements that we hear about, you know, the RCUK, the Willits uh, Speech to the Publishers Association, which I would have loved to have been at, um, they all talk about journals and science, and they don't specifically refer to humanities and social sciences. And that's really because it's very much uncharted territory when we're looking at open access in this area. So OAPEN is sort of really a good um, first step in terms of exploring uh, open access in the humanities and social sciences. I'm going to say HSS from now on, because otherwise it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but uh, one of the things that OAPEN found when they did their project was that although open access is all about dissemination and readership, and doesn't have any boundaries. When it comes to the practical hands-on processes and implementation of open access, it needs to be explored at a national level. And that's why we started OAPEN UK. It's really um, a very collaborative project working with publishers, with institutions, with the research funders, to try and tease out some of the issues and challenges that we will face in exploring and moving towards an open access model for humanities and social science monographs. I just want to say a little bit about why the timing is really important. In the last two decades, we have seen the number of print sales to libraries reduce from 2,000 in 1980 to just 200 on average in the, two, in the year 2000. That's quite a significant decrease. We're also seeing a decrease in spending by about 13% uh, decrease, according to a RIN report, in how much university libraries are spending on print monographs. The effect of this is that very um, few monographs are being disseminated into the scholarly environment. And this obviously has an impact on research and scholars. They need to have constant and continuous access to the monographs to enable further research to take place. Some researchers, um, Steele, Wilinski, Bazerman, they've all um, commented on this issue. And they've said that they feel that perhaps because the number of research monographs are decreasing in terms of sales, that publishers are now focusing on publishing only the very popular research monographs ones that will get more readership, that will bring in more sales income. And they're worried that this is having a negative effect upon the research environment. <coughs> so how are we working in New Open UK? Well, we are running two elements to the project. The first element is a pilot study. This pilot is with 58 HSS monograph titles, all published between 2006 and 2011, which is when the project started. So some of the titles in the project are brand new and had not been released previously. 
we invited publishers to uh, submit titles to us in matched pairs. And the reason that we did that was that we wanted to be able to analyse the difference between titles that are made available in open access and titles that are made available under the publisher's standard routes, so through their ebook aggregators, direct sales to the libraries, etc. So they had to match the pairs as closely as possible, and it is not perfect, I have to say, but they did a pretty good job of submitting titles based on and matching them based on their age, their um, previous sales history if they were older titles, um, their subject areas, of course, and so on. And we ended up with a relatively good range and diverse uh, range in terms of subject areas for HSS. We then put um, one title, it was randomly picked, one title from each pair, one to go into an experimental group and one to go into the control group. So we have a total of 29 titles in each of the groups. The experimental titles are all made, all made available under a Creative Commons licence. They can be uh, accessed on the OAPEN library, which was a result of um, an output from the OAPEN project. Um, and there are many research monographs on the OAPEN library and in open access. The titles are also made available on publishers' websites if they have them, institutional repositories if the IR managers or authors have deposited them, and they're 100% available in Google Books. The control group titles as I said, are just made available under the publisher's standard processes. So they're made available through the ebook aggregators on their own websites. And also, we mandated that they had to make them available 10% preview in Google Books so that we could do a, a good comparison. The publishers that we're working with are Palgrave Macmillan, Taylor and Francis, Berg Press, which is now part of the Bloomsbury Group. Um, we've got Liverpool University Press and University Wales Press. So we've actually got um, a quite good range of publishers from the larger publishers to the very small university press like, um, like Wales University, the University of Wales, sorry. In addition, because we have titles ranging from 2006 to 2011, we'll be able to look at uh, the impact in terms of does making an open access title available actually increase the sales of backlist titles or older titles? Does it rejuvenate them? And also, of course, the impact on sales data for the new titles, which is of great concern to the publishers. Um, so the model that we've chosen for this project is the, uh, is the OAPEN model. And that model is where a PDF is made freely available under a Creative Commons license on the web. But the model is... Um, looking at a transition between subscription, print, etc., to open access. So it allows the publishers to sell print versions direct to individuals or to, to libraries as well if they so desire to have them. And also if they're making them available to have ebook versions. So a particular format such as EPUB or perhaps something for the Amazon Kindle which is a proprietary format. And those can be sold. The idea being that in this transi transitory period the publishers can still gain some income coming from the, those particular versions. Um, during the pilot, which is running from September 2011 for three years, we are monitoring the usage data of all of the titles, the sales data of all of the titles. We're exploring how um, well we can use citation data, although the lag is quite difficult in HSS. And also, we're looking to work with iParadigms to um, get data from them in terms of have the titles really been used within an institution. Um, we won't be able to look at whether it's been plagiarised because iParadigms and the Turnitin service won't be able to tell us that. But they will be able to tell us if that title has been referenced or used within a student's work. And that, I think, is particularly useful information. Before I go on to look at the second phase of the project, um, I wanted to just raise some of the issues that we have encountered um, with a particular focus for institutional repositories, given that it's an RSP event. So when the project first started and we decided to make the titles available, we sent out emails to the librarians, and obviously Just Collections has a good link with the librarians, 
and we sent out emails on the UK core list. Um, and in, that, in those emails, we explained about the project and invited the librarians and the institutional repository managers to deposit the titles within their institutional repositories. So we gave them a big spreadsheet and explained who had what, so it was really quite a simple process. We gave them the link to the PDF and so on. The other day, I decided that I would um, have a look at the institutional repositories um, to see if any of the institutions had actually taken this forward and put them in. And I can say that only four of the, um, I think there's around 20 um, institutions, had actually put this title within their repository. So that was White Rose, Durham, East London, thank you, Gerdish, <laughs> and Manchester Metropolitan. Um, so the other institutions, including Nottingham Bill, hadn't done it. <laughs> I can name and shame them, actually. <laughs> In fact, the other day, I was quite annoyed about it, so I did name and shame everybody on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but um, I thought that in itself was quite an interesting finding from the project so far. We tell people that these monographs are available under a Creative Commons license, but what is the process for depositing these monographs into institutional repositories, and whose role is it? Is it up to the librarian? Is it up to the institutional repository? Or is it up to the author to do it? And how is it all joined up? You know, uh, that was something that came to my mind. The other um, thing that uh, I realized was that in our project, it's not just solely one voice monographs that we have. We also have edited collections. So there are cases where there is a, an author of just one chapter. And I wondered... Um, how that is dealt with by institutional repositories and, and the authors, given that the title, the book itself, is the entity. What is the policy and process for actually breaking out that chapter and putting it into an institutional repository? Or do repositories uh, feel happy taking the whole book and putting that in? I'm not really sure about this, and this is something that I'll be um, talking to institutional repository managers about as we go through the project. One of the other things I thought about was if we are going to be breaking down chapters within, a, within an edited collection, how do you maintain the Creative Commons element to that? How is the metadata attached to that element? And how is the actual chapter taken? Is it just ripped out of a PDF? Or are we asking a publisher, if it is a publisher that has published it, to provide that individual chapter? And then that led on to um, thought processes around identifiers. And at JISC and JISC Collections, we love identifiers and metadata and everything like that, um, and standards. So I then thought, well, if we are going to be breaking it down into individual chapters, um, we're definitely going to need to think about identifiers. Are we going to mandate that publishers have to put in DOIs for every single chapter um, so that we can then follow through the process in terms of usage and sales? And is it relevant to have individual identifiers also for the counterpart uh, print and ebook versions as well? So you can group all the information together to see how much revenue the publisher has generated from that one open access title and how that may be deducted from the upfront costs. So those were some of the initial thoughts that I had. We're almost at the end of our first year of the pilot. Um, and Another big issue that we found so far is usage statistics. Now, obviously, the PIRES project, which looked at um, article-level statistics, um, that really um, developed standards and protocols to support the analysis of usage statistics so that institutional repository download data could be compared with counter statistics provided by the publishers. And my feeling is that perhaps there is a need for this to take place in the monograph market as well. We have spent quite a lot of time talking to the publishers and the ebook aggregators about what data they can actually provide to us. Different publishers implement counter reports in <laughs> different, I mean, they don't do it differently, but they have, some have book report one, some have book report two, et cetera. Um, and the same goes for the aggregators. There is also um, the issue of Google Analytics. Currently, the OAPEN platform is not counter compliant. That's something that I'm pushing them to become. However, they are using Google Analytics. How do I therefore compare the Google Analytics data with the data gathered from the publishers? 
And when we bring institutional repositories into the mix, which I hope to do in year two by pulling some data from the, the IRs that do have the author's manuscripts in, sorry, monographs in, um, I think that it's going to become even more complex. So I'm thinking about running a sort of Pyrus project for, um, for scholarly, open access scholarly monographs to see how we might be able to develop a standards and protocols to support the comparability and of, of the usage data. And this perhaps might become even more important as usage and alt metrics become more commonplace in terms of analysing open access. So onto the research programme. Again, this is running throughout the four years of the project. Um, we are looking at three specific questions. I've talked about question two, which was the measurable effects. Question one is the policies, processes and mechanisms needed to change. Um, and also the perceptions of the project participants. So that's the authors that we have in the project, the publishers, the research funders, the people on my steering committee and so on. And I think question one is really about the nitty gritty. A lot of the talk today um, and this morning was very much at the high level. Um, this project's going to be looking at the impacts and processes and flows um, that are needed to be um, changed to support open access. So this slide just shows you very quickly um, what's happening in each year. Um, although I will say that this is going to be quite an agile project and I've already sort of changed up how it will, how it will progress in light of current findings. So we're running an annual benchmarking survey with our project participants. We've run an, uh, our initial focus groups. We've done a scoping um, survey with the HSS researchers and again I'll just highlight some of the findings from that. Um, we're doing the quantitative analysis of the usage and the sales data at the end of each year. And then we're doing um, planning for year three and also some specific work around perhaps this use of statistics, quality metrics, etc. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the focus groups because they were extremely interesting. Um, particularly learning about what the publishers thought about the authors, what the authors thought about the publishers, uh, etc. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, so many different misconceptions that are flat, you know, just sort of sitting around that really need to be teased out and verified. Um, so we held six focus groups. Our first one was with institutional representatives. That was with librarians, institutional repository staff, research managers, etc. The second one was with publishers, the third one was with the learner societies, and again that was really fascinating hear, hearing about the sort of uh, contention between working for the community but also needing to get money in to sustain their existence. Um, we talked to the researchers, ebook aggregators and also the research funders, um, which again was an extremely interesting uh, focus group. And these post-it notes just sort of um, show some of the topics and issues uh, that we got them to do. We sort of made them do lots of post-it notes and stick things up on walls and uh, it was all quite good fun. So I'm not going to go into all of these because we don't have time today, but um, some of the key themes that came out of the focus group were metadata, of course, um, so perhaps the work that Balvia alluded to this morning might need to therefore do a second phase to take account of the open access monographs. Um, versioning, preservation and archiving was mentioned in pretty much every single one, particularly with the researchers who were very concerned about people messing with their work once it had been released under a very open license, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, the methods of delivery, you know, what is the role of the institutional repository? Should the institutional repository be the place where all open access monographs sit, you know, or should it be on a central platform like the OAPEN library? Usage, quality and prestige as well. Um, there was a lot of uh, discussion about what authors want. And, um, you know, in the publisher focus group, there was quite a lot of push to say, oh, well, the authors just want their royalties. In the author's uh, focus group, they said, we don't care about royalties at all, and that's reflected in our researcher survey. But they do care about their careers. Um, copyrights, again, I'm going to allude to some of the initial findings from that a bit later on. And uh, benefits, international issues, again, which have been mentioned today. Changing roles, um, which are the things that perhaps we can change up, do publishers still have to do all the same roles? Is there a role for universities working with the institutional repositories to become publishers? Impacts on different policies and processes? Uh, standards, I love standards. 
<laughs> ways to make open access profitable, a big area for the publishers. They talked a lot about whether they could put overlay services onto their titles um, and where they might be able to add value. And the yeah, aggregators talked about that as well. And of course, you know, the biggest questions were around who actually pays for all of this and how much does an open access monograph really cost to be published? How do you identify the element of the open access monograph that is just for open access as opposed to any of the other bits that the publisher does to support the development of the print and electronic? So um, we've run our researcher survey, and I think we had over 850 responses to that survey, so I was really pleased with that. I think about 690 um, are usable um, following our, our analysis. Um, but the survey really shows that there is actually quite a high level of awareness about open access in the humanities and social sciences. Um, with, uh, and, and this is just shows you it by discipline as well. We thought it'd be interesting to look at open access awareness by their career stage to see if there was any difference between the, the younger researchers and the older um, more established researchers, they don't necessarily have to be older, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, we asked them if they had um, heard of open access and were, or were familiar with it, um, if they're aware or if they'd never heard. And you can see, see the results here, that awareness is quite high um, with, the, with the PhD and postdocs, but that the familiarity with it is higher in, in the later profession, career, career profession. I put these in earlier because there was a lot of talk this morning about Creative Commons. And as I said, in the focus groups, it came up as a real big issue for the researchers. You know, they spend a lot of time putting and creating these open access monographs. Um, and they really were not particularly excited about people being able to rip apart, reuse, and, and change their works. Um, when we first asked them in the focus group, they were like, oh, yes, that's fantastic. Yeah, we want to be able to do everything we want to do, you know, for commercial if it needs to be, etc. And then when we said, well, how would you feel about it if it was your monograph? Oh, no, 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 can't do it for my monograph. So that was, you know, really interesting. So we asked them in the survey um, about their awareness of Creative Commons. Um, and this is one of the responses analysed against their willingness to publish using Creative Commons. So you can see that um, the people that are aware feel more confident as opposed to the ones that aren't. So that's obviously quite transparent. We also asked them to identify which Creative Commons licenses they would feel most um, happy to publish under. Um, and this is really, really telling. You can see the massive spike in blue, which is a yes for CC, BY, NC, ND. Um, so that's, you know, you will publish in Creative Commons, but you can't do anything with it. So there was a real push, um, you know, and the other one is the CCBYND. Um, so there was a real feeling and sense that um, they shouldn't, that they didn't want their monographs to be available for other people to reuse, which is going to be an issue in terms of the movement of open access. Again, I've just sort of looked at this in terms of the career stage um, as to the ones that were feeling the most open. Um, which was the PhD candidates. They felt most uh, comfortable in considering the CCBYNC SA model. So that's just really a very quick snippet from the researchers there, where we asked them a whole load of other questions um, about their perceptions, attitudes, their values towards scholarly communications and so on. But I thought those were particularly interesting in light of the discussions this morning. Um, so what we've got next to do in the Open project are publisher interviews. Um, we are going to delve right into the processes and policies within publishing houses, talking to their editorial staff, their sales staff, the uh, strategic uh, members of their senior management, and also looking at the technical people to see what impacts it will have on their, on their processes. We also decided that instead of running a, a survey for librarians and institutional representatives, that we would do case studies instead. So we're now going to be identifying institutions to run some case studies, um, to go in and to, again, to explore different elements of the process. How does it work with the funding flow? What are the impacts for the research managers? How do the researchers within the institutions feel about it? So to try and get a real good grasp and understanding 
of the really practical element that would uh, be needed to uh, address in terms of a move to open access. The other thing that we've decided to do is arrange meetings with uh, vice chancellors of research. Um, and this is particularly because um, we want to know what it is that their strategy is. Do they, you know, are they pushing really for the institutional repository to be the key place where you, they really showcase all their work? Um, so that's going to be quite an interesting area. And the last two points, I've already mentioned Pyrus, that's something that we're going to be looking at. Um, but the Directory of Open Access Books, if you don't know about it, it launched very recently. It's managed by OAPEN, and, and that provides you with uh, information on all the um, open access book publishers that are available, um, and also metadata, mark records for each of those titles to go and be ingested within your catalogues. Um, but I'm going to be working with the Directory of Open Access Books to look at what the quality level is, the, you know, the verification process is for accepting publishers into the Directory of Open Access Books. And I'm going to be helping them in terms of what it is that libraries need and institutional repository staff need in order for, for them to feel comfortable and happy at spreading the news about these new open access publishers. So I think that's probably about it. Um, this is where we keep all the information on our project, OAPEN UK website. We have a Twitter feed at OAPEN, or you can follow me. And um, I mentioned already on Twitter that we have a Digo, Digo, Digo group called OAPEN UK. And on that, I'm tagging pretty much everything to do with open access. So if you're interested in the arena of open access, and particularly scholarly monographs, do join that group or set up an RSS feed for it. Thank you.